Okay, so our seminar series started last year and it ended up being very well received by all of us who are involved in biodiversity, especially freshwater biodiversity projects. And so um, we were chatting to, to Matthew and we decided to let's have another session for the 2022 because there's much, there were many topics raised in the first, in last year's session. And so we thought it'd be a fantastic way to kind of grapple with some of the issues in a slightly deeper, deeper way. So obviously many of our projects or participants joining you today either have JRS funded projects or are hoping to get JRS funded projects or are associated with work that is around freshwater biodiversity in Africa. And sometimes also broader projects such as capacity and even pollinator biology. So we're not exclusively limiting it to freshwater, but that is obviously the focus of the session. As I mentioned, I'm from the Freshwater Research Center and together with my partner in crime, Jeremy Shelton, we kind of are your, your facilitators or your hosts throughout the, will be throughout the series. We're quite keen to keep it pretty informal. We're not having formal presentations. We're rather putting together um, some topics for deeper diving and hopefully thought processing as a, as a collective group. Okay, so in terms of what I thought just to kick off, because I think not everyone is aware of the diversity of projects that the JRS is actually funding or have been funding in the past. And it's really nice to kind of get a broad overview sense so that we know, you know, what the group, the collective group that will be attending the seminars, you know, what they who they comprise of and their organizations and the sort of work that they're involved in. So for example, in the 2022-21 period, there was several projects funded from South Africa, Tanzania, uh, a journalist uh, focused project, conservation project, threatened species, and then the Lake Tanganyika floating wetland clinic. In 20, sorry, I just have to keep closing this tick box because I keep losing half the screen. Uh, our project, the, the FRC project followed on in 2020, this was our second grant. Projects in Malawi, Sandy, the Delta, there was a groundwater project. And then going back into 2019, a whole host of projects started in 2019. Many of them will be in their final year this year. So we'll definitely be able to learn a lot from the experience of all of these projects, ranging from Sandby projects, again, water journalists, Africa projects, uh, Tanzania, the award project of Sharon and Hugo, um, Malawi, another Dar es Salaam, and the University of Rwanda project, the Arbus project included. Our, this workshop, this, the seminar series stems from the workshop that was originally planned for 2020, but those of you who've been with us um, for a number of years now will know that never happened due to COVID, and it's actually bore fruit to this really fun and exciting seminar series um, that we're now uh, engaging in. And then going back to 2018, again, projects uh, in Uganda, Kenya, a multi-country project that was the Albertine Rift Conservation Society, Botswana, our first FRC grant, a mapping project, and then all the way back to the first, I think when JRS first started focusing on freshwater research um, I mean, freshwater biodiversity projects in, in Africa. But I just really wanted to do these few slides so that you get a sense of, you know, the diversity of projects, the diversity of countries, and the diversity of topics within the sort of the freshwater sector that are actually, and conservation sector that are being funded, just so that we kind of set the stage a little bit for our series. So what are the aims of, of this 2022 series? It's really to share experiences. You can see from the timeline of projects funded. Yeah, I think we, we were probably one of the first uh, projects funded in 2016 with our planning grant. We've had a steep learning curve. We've, we've, we've learned a lot and in, in turn learned from other projects that we've worked side by side with. And it's really to allow sharing of information amongst grantees, individuals, organizations, 
um, that have either already done projects or doing projects or have finished projects. And this will obviously benefit people right across the sector, um, trans country, as well as along a timeline. And in this way, we hope to learn from each other, allow common grappling with issues that, that, that are similar amongst all of the grantees. I think sustainability is one of the ones that's top of mind. Um, we all grapple with that and we all maybe have slightly different ways that we've teased it out. And that's the plan is to nurture our knowledge and in that way, nurture our community of biodiversity practitioners, especially within the freshwater sector. Obviously, we are focusing on Africa. That is the focus of the seminar series. But we very much like to engage with colleagues uh, in other parts of the world, including the US, Europe, and at the, at the moment also in Indonesia by way of the developer colleagues of ours that are based there. What I wanted to do briefly before diving into our first topic, which is really cultivating productive data provider relationships. As I mentioned in the email that I sent out for each of our topics, we are sort of teasing out three to five questions just to guide our thinking. But as I said, we're not necessarily thinking of formal presentations, but rather let's throw open it question by question to try and get input from various um, people in the room in the seminar at, at each occasion. So the questions for today are how do we identify different kinds of data providers? How do we approach and engage the data providers? What can we do to encourage data sharing? And do we need formal user agreements? And does this add a level of complexity that we do or don't want? And then very importantly, how do we maintain these data provider relationships going forward at the end of a funded project, for example? As a bit of a teaser, what I'd like to do is Jeremy and I have been working behind the scenes to kind of pick out interesting topics and we've been liaising with JRS in this regard as well. Um, topics that came up for needing further discussion in our 2021 series. And so the, we've identified a further five topics after today. The second, these may not be done in this order, but just by way of like the, the topics identified, one that will speak to platform synergies and scales. So the sort of questions we'll be asking are, what are the synergies among, why are synergies amongst platforms important? What kind of synergies exist amongst existing platforms that have been, sorry about that folks. Um, okay, so, Topic three is all about tra tracking platform impact. So why is it important to track the impact of data from a platform? How do we track it? And how do we maximize the impact? It's obviously very important to be able to make have your platform information system really impact decisions and policy and uh, management going, going forward. Topic four is all about sustainability of a platform and longevity. And the key questions are really, what are the key elements of platform sustainability? What are our approaches to ensuring lasting capacity and funding? And you know, what is the role of partnerships in achieving sustainable freshwater bioinformatics in Africa? And I'm sure all of the grantees will have had experiences around this um, and shared challenges to share with us. The fifth topic is all about platform outreach and promotion. Are these important elements and why? Um, and how do we approach it? How do we promote a platform? It's, you know, you can develop a platform, but if you don't tell people about, about it, no one's going to use it. So it's a really, really important aspect of a project. And what tools can we use to promote our platform? And, and is there a role of citizen science in growing our biodiversity platforms? And what is this role? And what is the role of training also in growing our biodiversity platforms? The last topic we've identified relates to freshwater taxon lists. Um, we, we're interested to know how different projects gather taxon lists and you know, what resources international and local do they use or do they rely on experts? 
uh, have grantees used GBIF and you know to what extent have you found this useful? Have there been issues? And if so, what are they? Has anyone used the, the FADA list, the Freshwater Animal Diversity Assessment List that um, Astrid from Barker University spoke about in the last session, the last series? And then how do we obtain an, an up-to-date taxon list? And how do we maintain these taxon lists? What is the best way going forward? So that really gives you a teaser to the seminar series for 2022. There'll more than likely be topics added down the line. And as I say, the idea is to um, really grapple with issues that are uh, experienced amongst us. And so in that way, you know, if you do have more ideas for topics, We'll be, we'll be watching the chats and making notes as we go, but you know we've got um, till the end of the year to kind of uh, keep the system or keep the series moving. Okay, so that's it by way of introduction. I want to now dive into the, the first of our topics, which is all about data providers. And um, I think uh, with your blessing, uh, let's, let's just tackle it question by question and then let's open up in a very, uh, easy way to to the to the group. Um, if you can just from a housekeeping perspective, just if you haven't added your name and organization to the chat, please just do so. And then if you want to ask a question, just raise your hands. I'm going to take away the screen now and just go onto the full screen. So the first question we really want to deal with is how do we provide, how do we identify the different kind of data providers? Okay, so anyone who's got any thoughts or ideas, feel free to, to jump in. Obviously we have some ideas, but the idea is to kind of share from other grantees what, um, what has been done. Welcome, Robin. Okay. Tashi? Uh, Hi, everyone. Um, um, yeah, I'm happy to be in, in this series again and see you all. Um, yeah, I just wanted to maybe mention that I suppose that will depend a little bit on the objective of the platforms, right? Because um, the FBIS platform, for example, you guys take a, a lot of, of different uh, data from, from different many different sources whereas for example in the BOD project we're a little bit more focused on sort of long-term uh, monitoring programs that are possibly more easily identified because they're, they're better known um, so um, yeah I just wanted to maybe just uh, leave that idea there that's a very, very valid point. Thank you for that. Um, hundred percent agree. Obviously, the the end, you, you know, the the broader the the platform that of the data that it serves, the broader your data data providers um, would be. Um, Hugo, welcome. Thanks, Helen. Hopefully, I'm not going to come through all broken. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I think it's rather serendipitous that Robin actually just joined as I was about to put my hand up. Um, I think one of the key ways in which we identified data providers was through our partners. So Robin, for example, from Sandparks pointed us in directions all over the place for different, you know, potential data sources. So, you know, relying on your partners um, is probably one of the critical starting points for your program. Mm -hmm. Very true. Agreed. Yeah. And I think um, also equally important is to, to bring in the partners because the, the partners could be data providers in themselves and the stakeholders equally. And so if they're, they're part of the journey right from the get go, I think you've got a better chance. Well, they assist in identifying other data providers, but then also become invested in the platform for providing data themselves or incentivized to do that. Great. I've asked Jeremy just to keep an eye on the chat if there are any questions there that come through that we can or comments. You're welcome if you prefer not to 
to chit chat verbally, you're welcome to just um, put some insight in the thing. Uh, Bonani, welcome. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Uh, I decided to keep quiet and, until I hear more from other colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, because you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, but in South Africa, because we are talking Africa now, in South Africa, um, we have mandated uh, government departments by law that thou shall collect that data of that kind. For example, um, we have uh, uh, environment, um, forestry, fisheries, and environment department that according to chapter 11, they must collect a biodiversity information in the country and report to the minister. That is a mandate. They have to do that. And of course, we do get data from other uh, departments um, like water and sanitation, although they may not be focusing on biodiversity per se. And then we do get an ad hoc kind of data for example, from uh, the point of view of Water Research Commission, we found a lot of research in the country and the researchers collect that uh, uh, biodiversity data according to the research uh, project. So there's that kind of ad hoc data, which is not necessary. Um, uh, thou shall by means of a mandate, it is part of a study. After a study, I always worry, how do we archive this data? So this is mm. just one source, but uh, there's always that kind of a, a concern which we are trying to address anyway. We can talk to that later. So those are the two main sources in, 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 that I would like to talk to. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Banani. Yes, um, I think in, in that, you know, your, the organizations that are mandated to collect this type of data, obviously, when developing an information system, it's, it again reiterates the importance of engaging with, you know, organizations <clears throat> such as the ones Banani is mentioning that we can, you know, that they become part of the part of the platform and it becomes sort of the, the mandated that the data gets added uh, as part of the workflow of that organization. Because, yeah. Okay, um, any other thoughts? So, so far we've got um, project partners, you know, work with your project partners, uh, including the organizations who are mandated to serve this biodiversity data or collect it. And in turn, also, um, for specific projects such as those funded by the Water Research Commission, uh, make the researchers well aware at the start that you know their data needs to be curated at the project end. And, and obviously, if an organization such as the WRC supports FBIS for the curation of biodiversity data, then that's you know, a real win for FBIS because it's it's being encouraged from the get-go by the funder of a project. So I think that's really, really useful. Um, Hugo, I'll take another question from you, then Sarah and Leo, thanks. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, so I think also another way in which we can identify the data providers is using a stakeholder approach, you know, that can be broad um, enough to include all stakeholders beyond just say your focus group or your kind of partners that you've agreed to work with. So I think, you know, holding a um, rather large open-ended meeting can often, you know, result in multiple data sources or potential partners um, being identified. Mm. Excellent point. So cast your net very broad at the start. And uh, I, think, I think many of our projects have started the project with a stakeholder workshop that has borne very good returns, you know, in the initial like reaching out to everybody and also at those meetings, asking other people if they have additional recommendations of who should be brought on board or who could serve as a data provider going forward. Thanks, Hugo, that's great. Ciro, welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a modest contribution. I think uh, in a data provider, like thinking about what you want to put together. 
Now, thinking about the different sectors that are important in the freshwater uh, biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And uh, at what uh, somebody has mentioned, we thought about the water sector, uh, in the sector here, and we're thinking about the forestry, uh, because uh, they are uh, the watersheds and the institutions dealing with biodiversity. And then, of course, there are uh, individuals who also the uh, data. And so uh, when uh, you are thinking about all that, you need to bring together and uh, start uh, a conversation with them. And sometimes you may find that it goes uh, and beyond because you may find that planning is important because probably the ones who are making decisions on the a freshwater ecosystems in terms of planning what will be done. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry, we had quite a bad line, but I think I got the gist of it. Obviously, with um, I think the important word there was identifying the key sectors, you know, that would use biodiversity data, and that includes very obviously the water sector, the conservation sector, the, you know, the biodiversity planning sector amongst others. And then it, your, your mentioning of the word individuals, I think was, was quite key in that, you know, often um, individuals are sitting with very valuable data sets that are often on one computer, maybe backed up on a hard drive somewhere, but that they've collected over time. And, you know, we've had instances where the, the person has retired and then unfortunately passed on and, and that the data that they, they had has never really been able to be reused or used again because it hasn't been secured in, in a place that, you know, such as an information system. And um, so what I wanted to ask then before moving on to Leo is just, um, you know, one of the things to think about is, is how do we get the different data providers on board? But I think that's a topic for the next the next point. So I'd like to move on to Leo then. Yeah, I was just going to make a point that I think in addition to just general data providers, you should consider your end users as well, using the data to create derived products. So trying to maintain those kinds of relationships so that there's feedback, if there's an output generated by them coming back to the system. So those could be additional sources of data, kind of secondary sources, so to speak. You mean like a report produced from using the data, if I understand you correctly, or? Um, so one might use your data to create another data set but where does that data set end up? So having it back to the system, I think it's important because you do get those kinds of products or derived data products from data. I'm not okay. sure. But I mean, obviously one doesn't want to duplicate the data. So you wouldn't be able to bring the data back, but you'd be able to say flag the data that was used, for example, a screening tool. That yeah. is the sort so, of thing that you're alluding to. Yeah, for example, what you may want to do when you, whenever you have things like that coming back to the system is when you publish them, having links to the original data set to say this was created from this and establishing that kind of lineage between your products. Okay, thank you. Hugo? Hi, Helen. You must just let me know if I've reached my quote. And <laughs> so, um, I, I just want to follow on what Leo just mentioned. Um, and I'm not too sure if I'm on the right track or the same page. But, you know, for example, in our program, we've been, um, you know, simulating, say, different thresholds of potential concern, which is data created from their data. 
Um, and it's a product which was, you know, developed um, in order to support them. And then obviously also the adoption of the platform. So I don't know if Leo is maybe mentioning that kind of byproduct data that's produced from data that you actually receive. I'm not too sure. Yes, I think that could be, yeah, as long as it's reusable in some form. Mm. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Hugo. Robin? Hi, everyone. Hi, Helen. So thanks. I just want to follow on from Leo and Yuho with data products. So, uh, for example, like if this is, I might have a question, so I'm going to use the data or download data for a specific question. I want to look at alien invasive species or rare species or something. But if you sort of have like a Google Earth engine concept, so I will write the statistical code for the example to pull out these things and do a sort of model of invasive species population dispersion over time. But as a product, I can share that code for somebody else who basically will use the same code, but just put in a different species into the data will pull out that and show you species distribution model of whatever species you chose for a specific river region. So there's always that feedback, like on Google Earth, it's a raw data set. People develop the sort of code for it and then you can get the code um, online, plug in your sort of region or area of interest and suddenly you're doing some hardcore uh, sort of remote sensing analysis. So that's sort of in the future that works quite well. We don't have to rewrite or recreate the wheel all the time. Somebody else already developed it and a lot of other people can use it to make it more um, accessible and easier for people that are not probably geared up for coding or writing huge mm. um, statistical um, sort of, I don't know, what do you call it, formulas, I suppose. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. So, so feedback loops and when when there's build on or extra value added to the to the data that you know those are discoverable by people who may come to the platform um i wanted to uh just move on because I, I just with a few hiccups earlier noticed the time running running away with us um pashi do you want to I don't know if it relates to the modeling side of things um and then we'll we'll move on to the second question um, well, it, it was more related to sort of these uh, data repositories, um, such as Google Earth Engine and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So one idea that I've been chewing on a little bit is uh, both project funders and universities and journals and so on, they are demanding data management plans more and more uh, for the projects they found, found mm -hmm. or, or you know, test it, thesis and this kind of stuff. So I suppose one way would be to try and approach these funders or institutions to, to try and access their data repositories if, if they have one. But I suppose another way of approaching that is try and make your platform um, a, a data storage platform where people can develop their data management plans on, if that makes sense. So rather than go out and try and find everybody that is storing data, say, look, I can't store data and I can propose a data management plan. Why don't you use our platform to do that, that you're required to do by your funders, etc. Okay, that's a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, a new take a new take on it, but for sure, I mean, we've been trying to think of ways to sort of mandate students to kind of upload data prior to to uh, graduating. So kind of a similar vein would be a project specific data management plan, but I like that idea. Um, it would encourage traffic or data providers to share their data. I see Jeremy's hands gone up, Jim. Yeah, just a quick observation before we move on. Um, I know we're running short on time, but something that that went off in my in my head. I think when Leo was chatting earlier, and mentioned that, you know, not only the data users should we be thinking about. I mean, the data providers, but also the data users, the people who are you know using the data to convert mm -hmm. them into end products that are important. And it just struck me that you know, 
it's we think about it as these are the data users and these are the data providers but actually it's it's not so it's probably not so uh, partitioned and it, in a lot of cases it's more you know oftentimes maybe the people that are using the data are also you know a part of the teams that are providing the data and so i think maybe just thinking about like our relationships with all these different you know these different networks of users and providers is maybe a bit more <laughs> yeah a bit less rigid than we like to make it and yeah just a, a thought thank you yeah very 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 important very valid okay so the second question just i won't share my screen again i'll just uh read it out is how do we approach and engage the data providers so we've obviously spoken a little bit around that already um hugo mentioned uh, the the value of having stakeholder workshops you know at the project start and we certainly found that was a good experience from our perspective not only for getting people excited about what you know the vision of what one wanted to do but but getting them fully involved and fully integrated into, um, you know, literally jumping on the bus uh, for the ride um, and, you know, moving collectively from the start to the finish together. Um, and in that way, the stakeholders that are also data providers, because I agree with Jeremy that the data users and the data providers and the stakeholders, it, it all kind of blurs. There's not really, it's a lot of shades of gray rather than black and white and some wear multiple hats that they juggle at, at multiple times. So, you know, throwing the net wide and, and having some sort of a stakeholder workshop we found was really beneficial and also including them in, in the design and the, and the user interface, you know, finding out right from the get go, what is it that you, the end user need and how can we work backwards from that um, to develop a system that that really does serve what you know that, that the end goals which is to to make a difference and provide some information at the hand fingertips of um, the end user hugo is that a new hand for the so i know you've got a lot of insight in this as well <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Um, I forgot to put my hand down, but I was actually typing my, my, my answer because I thought I'd rather give other people a chance. But if I may, um, for, for us, it's really, you know, creating essentially um, a demand or identifying a demand, um, you know, both with a data provider. And I mean, Jeremy is, is, you know, spot on when saying that a lot of the data providers are also the data users. So in our case, um, a lot of it has been around, you know, obviously collecting the data, but then also aligning the ways in which data is presented within the, in the platforms through the different user interfaces or dashboards that support, say, their KPIs or, you know, supports them reporting against their, um, what's it called, compliance. So, you know, you, you've got to allow for enough flexibility to accommodate, you know, what it is that the data providers would like from you as well as you know obviously as a data user so yeah that's that's kind of our approach is rather a a kind of demand driven rather than a push approach to 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 that yeah excellent thank you for that any other thoughts those of you who have just joined um, if you wouldn't mind just um putting your name and organization in the chat um that would be much appreciated so we're trying to figure out how do we approach and engage data providers, you know, in on a, on a newly developed platform uh, at the start of a project, for example, what's the best way to, to get them on board and get them engaged, not only as uh, data providers, but as data users and uh, kind of commit to the journey of developing a new information system, for example. I know we have a couple of new, not even yet funded participants in the house. So if anyone wants to ask questions specifically to the more experienced users, now is also your opportunity. Kate, I see your hands come up. Yeah, just, you know, um, Sandy has been around this uh, sort of playground a few times, <laughs> trying to get consultants, for instance, to... Um, kind of yeah to to give their wetland delineations and wetland maps oh, yes. the national wetland maps so it just might be worth chatting a little bit to 
Nancy to to Ajwa and for lessons learned there because yeah um they've tried all sorts of things that are are carrots rather than sticks and it's never really worked <laughs> so uh, yeah it's but maybe just chat to them yeah it's a pity that none of them are here um but we are, we will engage with them I mean obviously we it's an ongoing thing for us to to keep encouraging data providers you know um our our personal experience is that you know people are generally very keen but obviously it's a time constraint you know especially when it comes to to consultants um but that actually brings us on to the third point which kind of overlapping here is how do we encourage data sharing and some of the things that that previous workshops have suggested just to start getting people thinking about it is you know, to try and incentivize data sharing, you know, sort of communicating the benefits of sharing data, you know, sharing data um, to both the data pro providers and the decision makers. And I think one of the other things that has come up in the past is, is, is making sure that, that someone who provides the data, and I, I speak especially to like a an individual researcher or a consultant is to make sure that they understand that their data will be cited, that they remain the owner of their data, and that anyone who then uses their data, you know, on a system like FBIS will, will be given as part and parcel with the data, the actual metadata. So where it comes from and, and that this is like, expected to be included in sort of citations and, and what have you going going forward. So that's just a few thoughts from our side. I see um, there's a hand up. Um, I'm not too sure how to pronounce Mushangalusa. Welcome. Um, can I ask your question? You're on mute. Sorry, I'm not sure if you're hearing me. Musha Galusa, would you like to answer, ask your question? Okay, no one answering. Anyone else have a question? Um, one of the, the previous JRS projects, um, Laban from Uganda, he also came up with quite an interesting concept, I thought was, providing small grants to data providers. I'm not talking like the big, you know, government funded organizations, but, you know, perhaps um, smaller NGOs or um, even uh, universities possibly, but to provide uh, or research centers, for example, small grants to try and encourage data providers, obviously that has financial implications, but it does mean that, you know, someone's time could be covered a little bit in terms of getting the data into the system. Um, there was mixed sort of reception to that kind of a suggestion. Um, any other ideas? Leah? I think the, uh, another point is, supporting integration with other systems because you want to maximize utility of data, for example. So if people know that by submitting data to FBIS, it might be harvested by GBIF and other institutions, that, that's a good start, I would think, because you know that I can only submit it, I, I only need to submit it in this one place and it will end up everywhere. And people will discover my data that way. Thank you. That's that's indeed true. Agreed. And not only that, but if they know that their data is going to feed into the next national biodiversity assessment or the IUCN red listing and really make an impact, that might also be a very nice carrot um, for waving in front of, of people. Um, who was first? Jeremy and then Ciro. Cool. Thanks, Helen. My question was actually, yeah, I mean, just I'd be curious to know from Leo, you know, for a big established um, 
data repository like Sayon. Um, how does Sayon go go about um, encouraging yep, data sets to be submitted? And uh, yeah, um, how does is, is that something that just happens kind of automatically because these relationships have been standing for so long? Or does Sayon actually actively <laughs> seek out data partnerships with people or is it more moving data among platforms i'd just be curious to know like what happens behind the scenes at, at say on um, i think now it's mostly relying on those established relationships but to my point i think people ideally want their data to be shared with other infrastructures as well so supporting that and then offering value added services. So somebody might come to say on saying, I need a DOI quickly to cite my data set. So those kind of things are things that we try to leverage and, and kind of like build synergy between the two institutions. Okay, cool. Thanks, Leo. That's interesting. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, I hope you can hear me because I seem to have an internet connection from you now. Sounding a bit better. Okay. So I I look at the data sharing more of a, a relationship thing where I really have to uh, approach individuals more or less on individual basis, you know, because uh, when they uh, the general reaction is that they, there is always a, a bit of a fear of uh, losing data, it might be misused, and uh, quite a number of things like that. So, if the data comes in, as something mentioned, and it is a clearly acknowledged data set, which is uh, then published on the platform integrated, clearly acknowledged, and then the person knows that they are the owners of the data, that will have to remove the know that mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, attributed to them. And like the platform has taken over. So I think that is uh, uh, quite important. Uh, uh, because there is a, the fear aspect. Uh, which is uh, all over, partly uh, either because sometimes some providing the data are also trying to make uh, business out of that data. Uh, they actually uh, to pay to get their data. So when they bring it to you, then they're losing the business. So uh, there's an, an issue that really has to be looked into how to deal with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, we also do have some data providers here that, you know, they're sitting on a huge resource, but they're really not keen to, to share it yet. Um, and it's an ongoing challenge to kind of convince them that, you know, everyone benefits. I'm, I'm very into data recycling, you know, using the same data point for multiple purposes. And the only way that can really happen is through a, a system such as the platforms we've developed collectively in, in Africa so far, you know, that allows for data sharing. So, I mean, yeah, but changing mindsets is, is sometimes very, very difficult. Robin? Uh, so just to follow on from the side of pronouncing it correctly. So I was thinking about that too. Um, you know, I was thinking maybe it is having a look at your data providers as institutions. So let's say like state-owned organizations, or not state-owned, but state entities like Sandbox, DWS, DFFE, and all of those, they have a public mandate. You know, they get paid by taxes, money, share the data, share the data is fine. That's sort of what you must do. That's our mandate. So maybe it's not that hard to get the data from. But I think once you go into research institutions or private funding or, or these sort of things, you get this upload, data upload anxiety of somebody else is going to publish it before me or, or whatever the case may be. 
And maybe there's an option to put in a lead time to say, listen, I now finished my sampling this year. Um, the project funding will be done in two, three years' time. But there's a lead time to the data. So I'm going to give the data to Alan and the team for FPIS, but they won't publish the data or make it public in three years' time until I publish my work on my PhD or whatever the case. Mm -hmm. But then you can maybe make it public or at least put a clause to say, okay, Yugo, your data is on a data request. Robin wants to use Yugo's data. He has a little form thing to fill out and Yugo says, um, no problem, Robin, you can use it. I'm almost finished with the data. And the public now can use it, but with sort of uh, acknowledgement from the data provider. So I think for Sandbox, that's what we've done is that when there are international researchers or any researchers or people doing research in the park, um, we normally have a three-year lead time on the data to say, you've got three years to publish all your work and do whatever you want to do with the data. After that, the data becomes public, but it's not public in the sense where any Joe Soap can just access our database and pull off data. It will be um, you can request because he works for DFFD. I'm looking for weather data or water quality data. He writes us an official letter asking for it, we give it to him, no problem. There's no cost involved or anything, but the data is shared. So I think you might, people might be sitting, particularly academics, on a lot of data, but they got that upload anxiety and there's maybe some protections to that where they'll feel more at ease um, sharing data more easily, I suppose. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Yes, I mean, that's a good that's a good point. I mean, I certainly wouldn't expect somebody to provide their PhD data prior to, you know, graduating and um, publishing papers from it. But if they wanted to utilize the system whilst they're doing the, the PhD, one would kind of need to have that sort of timestamp, you know, three years post PhD, then that data becomes available. Um, Obviously, with time sensitive data, I mean, if there's an IUCN red listing happening and you've just done a huge study on a neurons, you'd want to, you know, get that data in. But I mean, that's, I guess, on a case by case basis. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Leo? I think another point I forgot to mention is convincing your data providers that you have a long term strategy mm. for managing their data, because one wants to know that 10 years from now, my data will still be accessible. So I think establishing trust that way as well will encourage sharing of data, knowing that That's you a do have a long term strategy behind it. Very, very good point. Yes, uh, agreed. Um, we, I think many of us are aware of the importance of, of that long term strategy, and it's indeed a topic for our session later down the line. But yeah, you don't want to put all the time and effort into uploading your data into a system and it's going to be defunct in two years' time. So, very, very important point. Thank you. Does anything come through on the chat, Jim? Any other yeah, we've had a we've had an interesting point uh, raised from Patchy again, um, and you know I guess it's along the lines of um, encouraging data sharing. There's all sorts of concerns or factors to consider when you know a person or an institute is might is considering sharing their data. And you know on the one hand, it's you know are these data going to be looked after in the long term? Are they going to be well looked after? Are they going to be stolen from under my feet? But I think Patchy's point in the chat was the this idea around, you know, I think people often don't have the time to enter to enter data sets or even single data points. So the easier and more pleasant <laughs> that a, a platform can make that process the better. And yeah, I think that's a really, a really good point. And I think something that probably a lot of a lot of the projects are are thinking about at least and probably approaching in different in different ways but yeah great great point patchy yeah very true very true um the other point that that Jim and i thought through like from our own experience is also to and it's what we're about to embark on on if on if on the fbus platform is to offer very inclusive data uploading training sessions so that um Firstly, develop a system that makes data capture easy, you know, 
uh, as easy as possible, a, a clean, easy to use user interface, but then actually capacitate the data providers to feel confident and capable to upload their, their own data. And that, that, that is across the board. That's from mandated organizations such in South Africa, our equivalent of Department of Water, Water and Sanitation, you know, where a lot of people have been upskilled in adding SAS data and the, the conservation organizations. But if people can feel very comfortable and capacitated, then they probably realize, A, it doesn't take a lot of time if I, if I know what I'm doing. And, you know, at the end of a field session or after a report, then the data gets, gets uploaded. Excellent. Um, so I think I'd, in the interest of time, I'm quite keen to just um, talk to point four, which was like, and I know, Sarah, you've had a lot of experience around this previously, and you had some insight in our last series. Are formal user agreements important? I know that when many institutions, once you want to formalize something in the form of an MOU, they need to get in their legal department and then that can overly complicate things. And it would just be nice to see from those of you in, in the chat, in the room, to what extent do you think formal data agreements are important? Does it make a difference or is those are those individual relationships that you have either with an institution or with a, an individual with an institution actually more important than a more formal data agreement? Um, so Robin, over to you. Uh, from my experience, MOUs are an horrific way to go. So you literally sit for 10 years trying to finalize MOUs with various, particularly government departments. I mean, it's, it's weird that government department needs MOU to work between government departments. I still can't sort of felt, can't figure out why though. Um, but the MOU sort of route is, yeah, you, you are expecting considerable delays in, in process or going forward with that way. Just from my personal experience, I think it's definitely key people in organizations that, that make it happen. The organization doesn't make it, there's people in the organization that, that is eager to be part of the working group, willing to share the data, see the benefits of sharing the data and using the data that other people are sharing. So I think that it is what is probably, you know, it's setting up meetings and saying what, you know, what the potential is, what the, um, how powerful the tool is that that unit in an organization feels okay to actually share data and think that it's important that we do share the data. So I think that's very important. Um, yeah, MOUs, Alan, it's, it's very tricky, mm -hmm. the MOU route. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you almost need to try, I don't know how you do it. Maybe Jeremy, Jeremy knows he's got a lot of publicity on CNN, he's on Daily Maverick, I mean, he's getting all the airtime for his <laughs> Sandra Mavish. So he's got all the publicity, maybe he's called CNN again. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> it's almost to, you know, you want to, not market, but you want to position FPIS as the platform to upload your data. So the organization feels, if you are collecting fresh water biodiversity data, this has to go to FPIS. It needs to be put on there. And if there are other competing, um, not competing necessarily, but other platforms, Yes, they are, but they're quite broad and they're big. But a lot of people need to feel that if this is where the data needs to go. Somehow you need to get that market feel in the country to say, my data has to go on here, it's important. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of social science, not social science, but citizen science, they're very excited to upload their data on iSpot and iNaturalist and stuff like that. There's something it's sort of an incentive to do it. So people go out on holiday, take a cool picture or go on field trips just to upload on iNaturalist. So we need mm -hmm. to get that feeling in organizations to do stuff, to put on FPIS, just to bring that excitement there. I don't know what it is, but iNaturalist, but it's trying to create that energy around it. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Yes, that's yeah, some very important points there. Gamification, I think Les Underhill is also quite into that. 
how do you make a, a user kind of feel like it's part of a you know a bigger a bigger game or bigger session hugo thanks helen um so what we found is that you know there's no cookie cutter that can actually fit them all um mm -hmm. so it really depends on the institution or individuals you're working with um so in some cases we've had to have formal mous before we could even look at the data um in other cases you know but we've that, had enforced sorry you go no i was just wondering were those the full-on legal legalese mous that yeah you know, so with the iucma it had to go through you know all the loops that kind of thing um to be able to get access to the data i mean generally it's always around you know the concerns of how we might represent water quality data causing potentially like a human health <laughs> crisis mm -hmm. or scare um you know so it's it's also and then obviously the way in which compliance is is shown and all that kind of stuff so it really depends on the institution um other cases where data was already open access to the public um say with the department of water affairs we just got an endorsement letter from the ddg so there was no formal mou type thing but it was still difficult getting the endorsement letter <laughs> but um you know other other data providers you know your open access type data sources, I mean, generally, it's it's still etiquette to kind of engage one on one with those data providers and see, you know, if it is possible to access their data through an API or some form of kind of scraping be it that, um, but at least, you know, getting the consent and providing the relevant um, references to the data that you that you're mm -hmm. getting. So, I mean, those are generally like the kind of three broad categories. So the MOU, the endorsement letters, and then just this kind of like acknowledgement um type you know data agreements essentially that we've that mm -hmm. we've worked mm -hmm. okay great thank thanks for that yeah we've also kind of done more data agreements rather than formal mous you know where you agree to share knowledge and share data but not necessarily the formal one but i understand that certain organizations that is a requirement and i guess then one has to just jump through those those loops as best as you can Thank sorry. you, uh, Sarah. Sorry, Helen. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, Sarah? I'm interrupting. I just, just to add, I mean, just to give one example, um, you know, you might be able to access the data. So through the MOU, say with the IUCMA, you get their water quality data, but we're limited to the representations of that data. We cannot pass that data on in raw format to anyone thereafter. Um, if that makes sense. So, you know, you're allowed to, to present the transformed data in the terms of the analysis, but not allowed to share the data beyond in the raw format. Um, you know, those are the kind of kind of clauses that okay. get put in, into these agreements. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's kind of the limiting factor. Whereas in, you know, Dupont Water Fair is not a problem. You can still, you know, distribute the data as long as it's acknowledged with all its um, clauses that came along with the data. Yeah. Right. Okay. So some is restrictive use. So you can you can use the data, but it's got a ring fence about what it can be used for, and, and that's agreed in advance. Whereas others, as long as you acknowledge and pass on the relevant caveats, then you can share it beyond the project, for example. If I yeah, understand. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, just uh, to share our experience, uh, we had really wanted uh, formal agreements, uh, but we found it too involving. And this is because once you go that route, then you find that the legal people in the institutions concerned have to be involved. And the moment these things get to lawyers, then they take completely uh, different dimensions. So. When you have a short project, like uh, uh, taking our example, we were funded, we were just starting, then uh, it proved uh, not to be the best way. But probably if you have like a FPS, it is useful to invest in the, those kinds of uh, formal agreements. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, also the other thing, as it has been mentioned, even when you have the formal agreement, it doesn't mean that then it's going to make things happen. So at the end of the day, it's really the individuals. Are they actually willing? Because whoever is signing a formal agreement when it's the institutional level, it's the head of that institution who probably has nothing to do with the, the subject or they know nothing. Then there will be the technical individuals who have to implement it. So trying to make sure that you have 
a good relationship with the actual people who actually will implement it is very important. So I would say when you have a, a, an established a platform like this, piece, then maybe formal agreements are good, a good route to go. But if it's just a very short uh, a project, then uh, the effort involved probably uh, is not worth trying to go that route. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Very, very useful input, Sarah. Thank you. Hugo, did you want to make another point or you? It's an old hand. Sorry, legacy hand. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. That's great, people. And then let's just move on to our last question. It kind of links to the everything that's gone before is, you know, in a, in a life cycle of a, a project, maybe three years, and if one's lucky you might have a, a follow-on project funded so, such as in the case of FBIS so by the end of 2024 we FBIS will have been around for six six years I guess um, and we will have got a good relationships with our stakeholders our data users our data providers the whole the whole stable of, of partners and, and collaborators um how what are the what are the key things do we think to maintaining data provider relationships i mean what are some of the nuggets that we can share with our data providers to keep them their interests going almost like to champion an information system um to kind of keep it uh, at, at the, the top of mind you know where people are thinking biodiversity data the first thing that pops out is is fbis I mean, obviously, I've got a few ideas that I'm keen for for other people to sort of think of, of creative ways or ways in which perhaps they have kept the data providers interested and on board and willing to keep maintaining. Because obviously, the, the more current the data, the more valuable the system that, that it serves. Um, so any, any thoughts on that side of things? Kate? Yeah, and, and apologies, I'm always coming at this from a kind of a consultant um, viewpoint rather than an academic or an um, institution. But, but that's excellent because we need many hats, you know, yeah. different sectors. So that's brilliant. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of providing biodiversity data to um, EIAs, for instance, the that old nugget. Um, you know, it's it's something that we do every day. So basically, just if FBIS is providing, you know, easily accessible graphs and and ways to look at your data, then it's always going to be relevant. And and the 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 requirements for um, biodiversity information is very explicit and and very prescribed in the legislation and in increasingly so, you know, with all the guidelines for mm. providing biodiversity data, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, it's, it's all there. And I think, you know, certainly at the moment, I mean, I'm sitting fiddling away with SAS data today on FBIS and it's it's great, you know, I can just pull out the information really quickly. So as long as it, it remains something that's kind of structured around the requirements of, yeah, uh, reporting really. Then I think it's always going to be relevant, and it's a and it's a good offering to those users because it's just it's rewarding. Yeah, every every moment. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Kate. Um, Robin's giving you a thumbs up. Jeremy, you muted. Sorry, just a few things from the chat, Hugo. Um, <clears throat> mentioned a similar thing to what Kate's Kate's been saying now, mm -hmm. which is yeah, the, the 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 closer you align the functionality of a platform with the users or the yeah, with the users' needs, the less um, I guess the less you have to do around that because there's a there's a core incentive, you know, for for those relationships to be maintained. But Ciro in the chat then actually also raised a, a really cool point, which is providing um the people who are contributing data on you know, providing them feedback on how their data are being used and what they're what they're being used for i think that's a really interesting idea and i wonder if <laughs> yeah if if any other platforms have thought about that or have started actually yeah 
sending sending feeding back to their community of of data providers you know whether those are individuals or organizations on on how those data are contributing to hopefully the greater goal of in, in our case you know better managed freshwater ecosystems um, mm -hmm. thanks that's a really yeah that's a great suggestion and um you know it could be as broad as you know a, a monthly newsletter like fbus focused like in the case of south africa i mean we're talking fbus that's the, obviously just for those who are new to the scene it's just the system that's been developed in south africa but in talking about fbus we're equally talking about a system in kenya or rwanda or botswana so you know it, it, the same the same ideas apply it's just you know an acronym that's specific in this case to south africa but if one I think to encourage data providers to continue adding their data and being part of part of a, a platform to give them feedback and they can see regularly, you know, where, you know, what the data, not just necessarily their own data, but like the data on the platform, what it's being used for um, and in, in what way. And maybe just also when there's new functionality added, like for example, in FBIS, we've just developed um, added a neurons and developed a thermal module to kind of send out small little news posts or newsletters which kind of keep interest um, peaked and allows people to come back and and look at the new functionality that may have been developed sort of since someone added their data for example um, great robin and then emily I think um, I think what's important and maybe also that could be some anxiety for data providers is the assurance that FPIS will be the platform in, in the long term because in South Africa so our pressure to buy number system was hosted by DWS and it, I mean it, it collapsed in the 2000s so it happened already so people are like mm. and if not saying what it, I'm not going to say what it is, but if there are, they say, this is a JRS funded project and you've got three years, people probably are anxious to say, okay, the project's going to last for three years, funding runs out and suddenly there's no FPIS anymore. So I think, you know, there is that sort of um, assurance to say, listen, for the next 20 years, this platform will be here and we will be using it and updating it and keeping it live and it will be the sort of data dispositive official the ecosystem biodiversity information mm -hmm. um you know you, you i'm not saying that it is that what it is now but there, there might be that perception of in three years time this sort of system is not going to be here anymore for an example so i think somehow some assurances will definitely help you in the long run thank you thanks robin you and that's a very good point and one made um you know from the from the Seon side of perspective as well by Leo, we are acutely aware of the importance of a sustainability plan. And, you know, I think bringing, like our sort of philosophy has been, if, if you make FBIS completely integrated into these key decision tools and decision pipelines, then the, the hope is that the sustainability will follow but i think it requires more of an active um journey than than that you know one can't just assume that if if people find it useful they'll continue funding it because it, it is a big picture um yeah. And, you know you don't want to be adding data into a system that that doesn't have a, a longevity i mean i would say at least a 20-year plan would yeah. be ideal if not longer yeah. thanks, thanks robin um, Emily? Hi, thanks. Um, I'm quite jealous of all of South Africa's uh, decision tools and how you can feed into them and everything, um, because you've already got so many um, organizations and tools and um, sort of uh, standards and so on in place that I think it makes it quite easy to develop those functions. Well, not easy, but the structure is there, um, which I think Botswana is lacking a little bit. So that's why I think we, it's important for us to really involve stakeholders to, to identify what their needs are, even if they aren't really formalized so that we can 
tackle them. Um, but what I wanted to ask then um, with feedback to providers, um, one of our stakeholders recently was talking about um, social media campaigns and launching, um, you know, giving information about functionalities and about, so my question was how much, how visible are, is everything on social media? Do you post regularly? Do you use those platforms um, to provide information? And um, if not, why not um, just, just about promoting the importance of biodiversity data and the functionalities of the system? Thanks, Emily. Yeah, very good points. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jim just now, but because he's our social media guru, but we're acutely aware of, yeah, I think we, you do have to keep um, getting it out there about what you're doing in the form of, you know, the, the, the cross the sector social media, as well as sort of news blogs and what have you. So between our social media platforms and the FRC website and, and even through JRS as well, we try and, you know, keep keep updates happening, keep new, keep FBIS top of mind if possible when it comes to South African freshwater biodiversity information. And I think the other platform that we found really, or the other way that we found really useful is to, to go to conferences and symposia. And, you know, if you're invited to a workshop, go and, you know, give an online presentation or an in-person presentation. And, you know, invariably you'll, you'll end up leaving the conference with like 50 different people who are super excited and if you target different types of workshops and symposia and conferences from like a pure academic one where you engage all the universities and the students get super excited and then you go to more of a sort of a wetlands in Darwin, which is more, you know, wetland practitioners that have been in the field for a long time and then they see the value of what's on offer and then they get excited. Um, yeah, so it's a broad, broad brushstroke, but I definitely think the social media is important. Jim, I don't know if you'd like to add something more to, to my response around that. Yeah, well, I mean, when, when you and I were chatting about the topics that, that surfaced in the last series that we wanted to focus on in this series, I guess this is really one of the ones that stood out. And yeah, it's um, it, it, it sort of presented itself as being so important that we actually decided to dedicate an entire one of these <laughs> sessions to that. So I think it's session five where we're really going to take a deep dive into platform outreach and promotion and you know, go a bit deeper into how the different projects and organizations are, are doing those relationships with their, with their data communities. And um, yeah, so I think <laughs> for now, I think it's, it's definitely something that's on our minds that we have a, a long way to go. I think probably all of the projects, but I'm really looking forward to that, to that uh, session five where we can take a deep dive into that. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, Robin? Um, I was thinking as well, maybe, you know, just to, um, you almost want to attract sort of where, not that big money or where big focus is placed. So for example, strategic water source areas, sort of a big buzzword in Africa, there's workshops happening all over the show and different regions and it's sort of articles been written left, right, and center, you know, it's almost to bring in that, that momentum where there's so many people working on it and mm -hmm. different organizations like WWF, it's biosphere reserves, it's all of these things, but you almost just put the layer on FBIS. This is the, the strategic water source areas that people can immediately pick up to say, oh, okay, um, this fish is there, this dragonfly is there, or or whatever the case may be, is in the strategic water source area. The data is there, people are working, there's collected day. We're going to do something about it. I think if you bring in that grouping, so to say, I call them a grouping, but there is a big sort of consortium now in this strategic water source areas buzz around the country. Literally, just a layer in FPIS, and suddenly there's a whole new uh, participants <clears throat> on, the, on the platform. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Robin. Yeah, that's really useful to tap into like specific focus groups, I guess. The good news is that FBIS has been a key resource for some of the reports that have been written around strategic water resource areas by, for example, the Institute for Natural Resources. Leah Quayle was delighted when uh, he sent me the 
the report and the citation was uh, was FBIS for for harnessing the data that went into kind of analyzing information for the strategic water source areas. But yeah, good good to tackle specific focus groups. One hundred percent, Hugo. Thanks, Ellen. Um, <clears throat> I think also key to um, you know, gaining bigger reach or, you know, making a presence is, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, so if you look at the biodiversity kind of community, mostly ecologists, you kind of go to the same conferences, the same, you know, shared thinking, you know, really at the end of the day, the responders, you know, are a direct result of the drivers of change, for example. So when there's hydrology conferences or water quality conferences, you know, go present there. I mean, um, the people you can collaborate with, the people that you can meet up with, um, you know, the exposure you can get for your system um, that you're developing in your country is immense. Mm -hmm. Don't just limit yourself to, to say, just the ecological kind of um, discipline, you know, really step out of your comfort zone and go present to the a hydrology conference. I can guarantee you'll get a huge amount of interest. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I hear you. I agree. Um... The synergies and the, the links between biodiversity and, as you say, the drivers are, are really key. So if you can, yeah, expand the, the target group to, to beyond the biodiversity conservation water resource managers, that would be excellent. Thank you. Any uh, other questions? I see we've, thank you for everyone's enthusiasm to stay on the chat we Jeremy and I have been debating whether we should have made these seminar series one hour one and a half or like last year where they were two hours last year however we did have formal presentations which tend to take you know an hour and then a discussion of an hour but I see this session's been an hour and a half um, even though it was only meant to be an hour so thank you all for sticking with us um, we might in future just you know approach it to the same way that we'll we'll do an hour and if the discussion is such that we want to carry on for an hour and a half there's no reason why we why we don't um i mean that's that's it in terms of our sort of the things we wanted to discuss um thanks for your thumbs up kate robin um hugo i'm assuming that's an old hand again um sarah thank you sorry i'm terrible with this no, it's, it's fine, no problem. I just don't want to not, uh, not um, give you an opportunity to ask a question if you, if you have a burning one. Um, fantastic. So um, I don't really have anything else that I want to add, but I'm happy to continue on for a little bit longer. Thank you. So has anyone else got anything they want to add or should we sort of officially close our, our first very fun session from myself, definitely. Yeah, okay, it looks like everyone's, everyone's happy. Thanks for your, your time joining us. Um, we will obviously, as always, provide a, a YouTube uh, copy of this on our, on our YouTube channel, which Jeremy will work his magic, cutting out the session where I disappeared for 10 minutes or what have you, an edited version. And it'll be available to yourself and, and your colleagues. I will distribute it to the full group of the, the members, which is just almost 80 people now have asked to join the seminar series um, sessions. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks time, again at, at two o'clock so that um, our colleagues, international colleagues are able to join. And yeah, just again, thank you all for your contributions because obviously this is our session and it's, it's our collective insight and knowledge and experiences that's gonna make or break our, our sessions. So uh, a pleasure being with you and we'll see you in two weeks time. Thank you so much.